Diagnosing psychological disorders is a tricky topic indeed, but before we dive into the issues surrounding diagnosis, it's important to first consider a more basic question. How can we distinguish different behavior from disordered behavior? Let's consider some historical examples of extreme behavior and evaluate these cases as different or disordered. Dutch painter Vincent van Gogh is one of the best known and most prolific artists of his time. He created over 2,000 works of art in a career that lasted only 10 years. This painting, entitled Self-Portrait with Bandaged Ear and Pipe, is a glimpse into his unusual behavior. Van Gogh did this painting after having an argument with a friend and, in a fit of rage, took a razor and cut off the lower portion of his left ear. Then he wrapped the earlobe in a newspaper and gave it to a prostitute named Rachel, telling her to keep this object carefully. So for a bunch of reasons, Van Gogh was certainly different than most other people. On the one hand, he produced some of the most influential works of art, but in his personal life, he was prone to extreme and unstable behavior. The painting above is one demonstration of his self-harming behavior, and he eventually died by suicide. There is much speculation of the cause of Van Gogh's unusual behavior. He had several major depressive periods, as well as manic and psychotic episodes, so most people agree that he likely suffered from mental illness. Let's consider another case. Witold Pilecki was a Polish soldier and founder of the resistance movement in German-occupied Poland. He was voluntarily imprisoned at Auschwitz in order to secretly report on what was happening there. He stayed for two and a half years and later escaped. This behavior is certainly different than what most people would do. This mugshot here, however, is not from his time at Auschwitz, but when he returned back to Poland and was accused of treason. He was imprisoned, tortured, and executed, not by the Nazis, but by the Soviet-backed Polish government. This photo was taken at his trial, and although he doesn't look happy, he also doesn't look disheartened. Like Van Gogh, Pilecki's behavior intentionally caused him harm, no doubt about it, but the circumstances and motivation for his actions means that history remembers him as heroic, not disordered. These two examples highlight the challenge in distinguishing different, in the case of Pilecki, from disordered, in the case of Van Gogh. The current theory and practice of diagnosing mental illness has been heavily influenced by the medical model, which states that mental illness is best diagnosed and treated as a medical illness. This perspective on mental illness contrasts earlier views that considered mental illness to be caused by moral weakness or even demon possession, and treatment sometimes involved extreme measures, like drilling holes in the head to release evil spirits, like in this 5,000-year-old skull. The medical model is certainly a move in the right direction, based on the evidence we have about the biological basis of psychological disorders but the medical model presents some of its own challenges. Let's take an example of a clear physical medical problem, a deep cut in the finger. A physician can tell, without even talking to the patient, what's wrong and how to treat it. Clean the wound to prevent infection, stitch it up and bandage it. Easy. But some physical conditions aren't so obvious just by looking at someone. Take a heart arrhythmia or irregular heartbeat. You can't tell just by looking at someone whether they have a heart arrhythmia. A doctor can talk to the patient and get some idea about symptoms, but it's not as obvious what's wrong like with a finger wound. Using a simple device, like a stethoscope, or an ear to the patient's chest lets the physician know what's going on. What about someone suffering depression? Certainly you can tell by looking at this man that there's something wrong. But maybe his hockey team just lost the final. Maybe he'll get over it. Maybe he's been feeling this way every day for months. Clearly, it's necessary to talk to the person for some time to differentiate different from disordered. So diagnosing psychological disorders involves a bit of a judgment call. We can't tell just by looking at someone what's going on, and we don't have any devices to tell us what's definitively wrong. So what information do diagnosticians like psychiatrists and psychologists use to make their decisions? One of the first attempts to provide some guidelines about diagnosis was by German psychiatrist Emil Kraepelin. In his publication, Compendium der Psychiatrie, in 1883, he put disorders into categories so that diagnosis could be standardized and measured. It wasn't until 1952 that a similar attempt was made in North America by the American Psychiatric Association, or APA, 
with the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. The DSM has become the standard in North America for psychiatrists, psychologists, medical insurance companies, and others involved with diagnosis. Let's look at the history. The DSM can be and should be considered a work in progress. The 1952 edition was the first North American classification and was about 130 pages in length. The DSM II was published in 1968 with some modifications to the original, but not a lot added to the length of the document. The DSM III came out in 1980 with a revision, the DSM III R, in 1987. This was revamped to make the guidelines consistent with other tools, like the International Classification of Diseases, or ICD, developed by the World Health Organization. This update greatly increased the size of the document and the number of disorders. The DSM-IV came out in 1994, followed by its revision, the DSM-IV-TR, which stands for Text Revision, in 2000. This attempted to provide clearer diagnostic criteria and emphasized an empirical, evidence-based approach. This greatly increased the length to 886 pages. Most recently, the DSM-5, which ditched the Roman numerals, came out in 2013, and there were some changes to how disordered behavior is viewed. In previous versions, there were separate axes to consider, but this was replaced by a dimensional approach that places behaviors, thoughts, and emotions along a continuum. This most recent revamp also increased the length, so the current version is 947 pages long. Although the DSM is a useful tool for treatment providers, it is not without criticism. One criticism is that the DSM medicalizes normal human behavior by labeling normal reactions to life events, such as sadness after losing a loved one, as mental illness. The DSM-5 did make an attempt to address this, to some extent, by introducing a dimensional approach, so diagnosis considers the gray area and is not based strictly on yes or no categories. However, the dimensional tools have only been developed for some, but not all, disorders. Another criticism of relying on the DSM for diagnosis is that it has a strong North American perspective, and some argue that the American Psychiatric Association has had too much influence. Another classification system developed by the World Health Organization is the International Classification of Diseases, or ICD. This is used for diagnosis of all sorts of disorders, not just mental illness, and has gone through many revisions. The ICD-11 was developed in 2018 and takes effect in 2022. Lastly, some take issue with the idea of mental illness altogether because it ignores moral and social norms, which have a big influence on whether behavior is considered abnormal or not. Thomas Zaz was an American psychiatrist and academic who challenged the very idea of mental illness in his books, The Myth of Mental Illness and The Manufacture of Madness. He argued that mental illnesses should be considered problems of living rather than defined diseases. For instance, poverty is strongly associated with substance abuse, but the DSM considers addictive disorders as a problem with the individual, not society. Another problem in diagnosing mental illness is the stigma surrounding it, because as a society, we have a tendency to judge people with psychological problems, and this can lead to negative stereotypes. This is an enormous barrier since it means that people often don't want to admit they're suffering from mental illness and might be hesitant to seek professional help. It also means that people might not get social support they need from friends and family, which is really important in overcoming psychological disorders. A number of initiatives, like Bell's Let's Talk Mental Illness, have tried to raise awareness and reduce stigma, and has been championed by Canadian Olympian Clara Hughes. She's won medals in both cycling and speed skating, but suffered from bouts of depression and struggled with alcoholism throughout her life. By talking openly about her own struggles and how sports helped her overcome them, she is trying to change the way that society views mental illness. So this summarizes both the history of diagnosing psychological disorders and some of the challenges faced in trying to make a meaningful diagnosis.